Welcome to HIV Hope and Charity, a podcast series brought to you by TVPS, a charity that's been supporting people affected by HIV since 1985. I'm Sarah. And I'm Jess and we work for TVPS and our aim is to get as many people as possible HIV educated. If you like the podcast, please rate, subscribe and leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Well, hello, welcome to HIV Hope and Charity. Welcome to... Oh, my dog's welcoming you to World AIDS Day. Don't know if you can see this. (laughs) Brilliant. (laughs) Welcome to World AIDS Day, Sarah, from myself and Jimbo. He's very enthusiastic, isn't he? Isn't he? He's like, I've waited all year for this day. Here we go. Red ribbons, ahoy. Has he got a red ribbon? Oh, there is. Yeah, there's a picture. I put a picture on our um, ribbon wall because I felt that he would like to wear one. We've got one of Gracie, haven't we? Yeah. I mean, she's not enthusiastically wearing her ribbon, is she? <laughs> Laid it on top of her. A cake star. <laughs> <laughs> she's not a fan of a, of a ribbon, funny enough. No, I just think she's not very, uh, just very enthusiastic. I feel I feel her size and her eye rolling at whatever you make her do, to be honest. And I like it. No, I no. like her attitude. <laughs> okay, right. So this week, it's a big one because we are doing a three-part trilogy for world one not two but three three special episodes and they're all going out today aren't they all of them they are are all going out today so i'm kind of following the theme of well lord of the rings toy story back to the future (laughs) aren't there four toy stories what did you miss they were three oh right discount toy story then (laughs) 50 shades of gray 50 shades of gray that was a trilogy was it (laughs) Do you know what lost me after the first one? Well, <laughs> see, you're an enthusiastic fan, though. <laughs> no, <laughs> look at you. I only I read the first book. There was only one film, to be fair, but there were three books. I only read the first book. I did buy the other two, but if I'm honest, I didn't read the whole thing because you know I just flick to the pages flick, that flick we were all what? interested in. You just <laughs> what? <laughs> like, what are we saying here? <laughs> Also, I need to correct you again. They did make three films of Fifty Shades of Grey. Did did they? I swear they did. did. They? Oh, I'm going to have to fact check so much of this. Excellent. Okay, so you've, you've ruined the introduction. Sarah just living in the past. Nah, they didn't do that. There's only three Toy Story films. Like, well, this Christmas, Sarah, there's another one for you to enjoy. There's one that came out much later, isn't there? Yeah. I have seen it. I didn't think it was as good, if I'm honest. Yes, when Andy's grown up. No, no, no. You can't include that in the trilogy. No. It's too late. <laughs> I'll let them know. I'll let Pixar yes, know. Yes, if you could. Right. That's the circles. I think we now move in. Obviously not fully researched, but I'm not a film buff. I'm a historian. An HIV historian. This is the, the day for you. So yes, professed HIV historian. Oh, so our trilogy, it's to celebrate World AIDS Day. As I said, it's on the 1st of December, which is today. We're going to start by looking at the people that discovered HIV. Then we're going to look at the man that was cured of HIV. And we'll finish by looking at the origin of the red ribbon. So, Jessica, strap yourself in. That's a bit Fifty Shades of Grey. Come on. Well, it is. Yeah. Strap in, strap in, strap in on. I don't know if they had strap-ons in Fifty Shades of Grey. I don't know. I didn't pay that much attention. (laughs) You were too busy flicking the pages, as you were saying earlier. (laughs) So sorry, that's such a a cheap joke. (laughs) Completely ruining our trilogy. Focus. (laughs) Right, this is going to be quite a journey. And we're going to start with the two people that discovered HIV. Now, to cover ourselves, I mean, there were probably other people involved because they worked for a scientific institute. But the two names that stand out are Francoise Barry Sanusi and Luc Montagnier. Now, as always, probably completely butchered the pronunciation. I think I think you did well. It's a good effort. Yeah, well, I've tried my best, and that's all that matters, isn't it? Between them, they identified the HIV virus as the cause of AIDS. So Francoise was a scientist working at the Pasteur Institute in Paris, and when she joined the institute, Luc Montagnier was her mentor. So she worked in his unit. So that's how they knew each other. Working with him and someone called Jean-Claude Sherman, they isolated and grew a retrovirus from a biopsied swollen lymph node from a patient who was at risk of developing AIDS. That retrovirus would later be known as HIV-1. And the little virus they'd grown could then be used to uh, to develop diagnostic tests to control its spread. Now, I know I've just made that sound 
massively simple. They just grew the virus and there you go. The problem was solved. But it was much more complicated that, than that. And growing that retrovirus was just the start. But it allowed Francoise to scientifically investigate lots of areas related to HIV. So the um, host immune defences and control in HIV, understanding mother to baby transmission, and also why some people, albeit a very small minority, are elite suppressors or controllers. So they are people whose immune system have the ability to limit HIV replication without antiretroviral drugs. And that's why our podcast is more focused on her. Now it's sciencey. Oh, and I can see your face with the big eyes. It's very science heavy, this one. It is science heavy, but it's interesting as well. You're going to have to pay really close attention. Well, you are, yes. Got my science glasses on. You have. They do look like, but they're not actually lab. No, no. (laughs) No, but is that what they look like? They're proper, like, reading glasses. Oh, (laughs) I thought I was just wearing a prop. Oh, oh, I don't know whether to be mortally offended or kind oh, of flattered. No. Well, there we oh, go. No. You've got proper science glasses. You're taking this really, really seriously, but they're actually just your reading glasses. Yeah, they're just my day-to-day glasses. Oh. oh. <laughs> I love it. This is amazing. Okay, that's fine. We can pretend. We can pretend. Where's your white coat? I want to see a white coat on. But do you know what? I haven't got a lab coat, bizarrely, because I don't work in science. And the nearest I had was a dressing gown. Oh, yeah. No, I'm glad glad you didn't turn up in a dressing gown. That's a cheap effort, isn't it, really? So I'm just awful at dressing up. I was the mum that, you know, when kids have to go to school for World World Books Day, would just shove a blanket over them and say, pretend you're a wolf from Red Riding Hood. That kind of thing. Why would a wolf wear a blanket? Oh, I'd make some ears, maybe to go with it oh wait did the wolf wear a blanket in red riding hood no but it would replicate the wolf's fur oh in some i thought way. it meant like it do you know can i tell you what was in my mind this is where we've got confusion here in my mind i was thinking white sheet rather than you were thinking furry blanket yes i was thinking white sheet and that's why i was like why would a wolf wear a sheet what <laughs> No. We were we were coming at different different angles there, different angles. Mm. So no, I don't have a white lab coat. I'm so sorry, but I'm like, I'm glad you make the effort. I appreciate that. Well, apparently, mistakenly making the effort for both of us to be extra sciencey. <laughs> okay, right. Are you ready? I've got my listening ears. Excellent. So we're going to look at how the virus was discovered because it's a key moment in history. We just can't overlook it. So Francoise had been working on the link between retroviruses and leukemia. And when HIV first emerged, nobody was sure what type of virus it was. So to give you an idea of how difficult it was to ascertain the type of virus, you need to know, and this is according to National Geographic, that there are an estimated 10 nanillion individual viruses that exist on our planet. If you're a maths person, that's 10 to the 31st power. 10 nanillion. I've never even heard of that. I swear you're making that up. A nanillion. I'm not. It's in National Geographic. Now, to put that into context, that is enough viruses to assign one to every star in the universe 100 million times over. You're blowing my mind. I blew my own mind. Now, before you start panicking, I can see your face. I can see the math sinking in. And no one's a fan of viruses at the moment, let's be honest. I should point out that quite a few of those viruses aren't infectious, but that just shows how many there are. And it gives you an idea of what the scientists were up against when they're trying to identify HIV. Where do you start when there are so many viruses that you're dealing with? That's so, crazy. That's really, really crazy and really terrifying. All in one note. Oh, no. Really? Goodness. Huge number. Absolutely <sighs> huge. And think about the number of stars in the sky. Is this episode going to get less scary? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Because when you hear what the scientists did and how they found out, you, you think they are geniuses absolute geniuses okay then please proceed and unscare me okay the early 80s scientists in america and in france they're trying to establish just what they're dealing with so they weren't even sure at the very start that they were dealing with a virus so a group of physicians in france helped put the french scientists on the right track so they came to the pasteur institute to ask if the new disease was caused by a retrovirus so the physicians gps i think we call them them were providing frontline care to those with HIV and AIDS and they'd noticed some indicators as to what they might be dealing with. Francois 
and Luke and their colleagues concluded from their research that this new illness was possibly a new retrovirus. So there are only six retroviruses now, and most of those are linked to HIV. But back then, there was only one, and it was linked to leukemia. And that's what Francoise was working on. So now we're going to get very sciencey, but again, more. it's going to help understand. We're going more science. Well, what's the way? to tell if a virus is a retrovirus and that is not a joke by the way that is an I mean that question. did sound like it <laughs> it did I know I realized as I said it <laughs> Stop. there's no punchline if something called reverse transcriptase activity is present then it's a retrovirus and I'll explain what that is and then it might make more sense reverse transcriptase allows the virus to insert its DNA to the host cell's DNA, forcing the cell to make more viruses. Yeah. It replicates itself yeah. all the time. Oh God, I so feel more intelligent already. I'm, I get this, I know. Yeah. Yes. So when you understand that process, it helps you to understand why it's so difficult to decipher HIV. Because the immune cells that you need to identify are really difficult to obtain because the HIV virus attacks so quickly. So the number of cells is depleted. So imagine you're trying to extract cells to find out what type of virus they are. And they're being taken over by HIV cells. And that's changing, obviously, the the structure of them. And that's one of the difficulties that they faced. Are you with me so far? Just about. I don't know if everyone's there. I mean, I don't know, guys, if anyone listening is still on board. I mean, I think so. I think I'm with you. I hope we're all there. I don't know. Let's keep going. If nothing else, it shows just what a genius Francoise is. Because this is the environment she works in. It also right. shows that we will probably never be scientists. We're not going to branch out into science. We're not going to branch out into sport. Or film. Or I'm, film. I was definitely call it not. Filmology. But I, I feel like that's not a thing. It's not a thing, is it? Filmology. Don't ask me anything about ologies remember cosmetology no <laughs> go there that's true no <laughs> ologies for you no no, no. cinematography oh. Oh. <laughs> sorry go on so what Francois decided to do because obviously she needs to identify what these cells are they keep changing because they've got HIV within them so she's decided to use lymph node biopsies from patients with lymphadenopathy which was a very common symptom of late disease progression in people with HIV she took these cell cultures from these people and she monitored them and the reverse transcriptase activity they were looking for was present but they noted the activity decreased when the T lymphocytes in the culture began to die and we know T cells yes yes linked to HIV so what they did was they added lymphocytes from a blood donor who was HIV negative to save the culture and she noticed that the virus transmitted to the newly added lymphocytes from the blood donor and the same actions happening again. The same reverse transcriptase activity was again detected. So now they can see how the virus works. So it doesn't matter what you add to the culture, it's going to continue working. So they named the virus LAV or lymphadenopathy associated virus, and then they later renamed it to HIV. So all that work she's doing, and even if you haven't kept up with what she's doing, at this point, you can see that it's complex. All that scientific work helped to establish that HIV couldn't possibly be restricted to what they called the four H's at the time, homosexuals, haemophiliacs, Haitians and heroin addicts. That is more of an American label than the UK one. You're bursting to speak and you just put your hand up. Because <laughs> I know I butt in all the time. So I'm like, don't do that, Jess. She's in the middle. But that's, we talked about that in Reclaim Dugar, episode one of HIV Heroes, right? The four H's. That's okay. right. So that's what um, everyone associates with the virus at the time. But Francoise and her team have proved that that cannot possibly be the case because of the way that the virus worked. So they had uncovered the fact that the likelihood of HIV being transmitted to anyone was very possible. It's not picking people by the label that they fall under. It's basically using anybody's blood to replicate. And because they knew that, they knew we were heading for an epidemic. So they, they knew whatever they did next was going to have a massive impact on the world. Imagine that pressure. And also don't forget that, you know, they're not the only scientists looking at this. American scientists are looking at it too. And there's a bit of a race, as there was with COVID, with the coronavirus, to see who can come up with um, a vaccination. It's the same sort of thing. They're all working towards the same goal, really. But there is obviously an accolade to being the first to reach that goal. That's very true. I mean, we're not talking about the American scientists that were working on this are we we're talking about the people that got there first well yes ultimately we are but we shouldn't discount them because all of them were working towards this and and maybe 
kind of liaising with each other. I don't know. I didn't look into that part of it. But at the end of the day, they need to find out what this is and they need to make sure that it doesn't kill people like it was at the time. Right. So a little bit about Francoise, because her work around HIV and leukemia, I mean, it's led her to become a world wide renowned scientist. So she's co-authored 240 scientific publications. She's participated in over 250 international conferences. She's worked tirelessly to improve uh, HIV prevention, clinical care, and of course, treatment. So, I mean, she's a pretty phenomenal person and really the best place to be working on the virus and, and to find out what was going on. So we all know what it's like to live with a virus that's literally come out of nowhere. There are similarities between COVID and HIV. There's no cure. There's a lack of understanding initially about how it was transmitted, um, a variety of symptoms. And we're all grateful to the scientists who've worked tires- tirelessly. Edit Not that tiresomely. Out. Tirelessly. Sounded <laughs> like you were saying tiresomely. No tirelessly to understand COVID and produce a vaccine. So I think we can all appreciate the work that Francoise and her team undertook in order to ascertain the virus that was killing patients back then. Um, Her findings created a more solid understanding of viruses in general and therefore a more informed approach to handling viruses like COVID. Scientists are amazing, aren't they? What a load of information my ears have just taken in. I know. Well, Francois, she's number one for me. If I had a scientist top 10, she would be number one. I don't, but I might create one. She's your number one scientist? Yes. Well, fair enough. And can I just say, we've actually seen her, haven't we? Um, Look at me making her a celebrity. We have actually seen her in the flesh. Mm. Yes. So a couple of years ago, we went to the International AIDS Conference. We're lucky enough to go in Amsterdam. And it was absolutely fantastic, wasn't it? It's just so many amazing organisations there and speakers. And it's actually opened by Prince Harry and Elton John. Charlize Theron was there. Prince Harry was, yes. Elton John, Char- yes. Lots of people. It was amazing. And they did this really wonderful event called the Positive Flame. And they had all sorts of different people from the community of HIV. Francoise was one of the people carrying one of the torches one of the flames it was really lovely and I took a really zoomed in picture of her face because I was really impressed that she was there so I will share that you'll see how far I am away from her trying to make it look like I'm close like you're standing next to her (laughs) well it's quite a fuzzy picture you can see there's a heavy zoom going on there but you know it was pretty amazing to be like you're saying in the presence of someone who and I know there's tons and tons of people that worked on this but to be in the presence of the person in theory that is accredited with discovering this pretty insane it is insane and when you look into the work and yes I've probably not explained that well what she did because it is very complicated science is not our speciality as everyone can see now but just to know that's just to understand how their mindset works it's so different isn't it and they have to be very methodical and they you know have to come up with new ways of kind of isolating the virus and doing biopsies and monitoring cultures and it's just it's absolutely incredible I just can't get over Nanillion that's going in my my my, my little mind roller decks of new words. Oh, that's, we can start using that. I've got a million things to do today, Jess. I just called my brain my mind roller decks. <laughs> Oh, I'm not into science, Sarah. It's not for me. I don't think you should continue wearing those glasses. It's changed you. Oh, man. Yeah, you're right. I haven't earned them, have I? (laughs) I've got a really good Deidre Barlow pair. I'll put those on for our next episode, Timothy. And you can enjoy those. Excellent. But but thank you so much. That was amazing. Well, it was a very sciencey HIV Hero edition. Thank you for listening to HIV Hope and Charity. If you'd like to know more about the work that we do, visit tvps.org.uk and please like, subscribe and rate the podcast if you enjoyed it.